Um, Mark Jumper wants to know, what should be the guiding principles of conservative foreign policy? One of my favorite questions ever. It's very simple. America's foreign policy can be described in one word, freedom, period, freedom. That's American's foreign policy. It's consistent, it's predictable, it's moral, it's decent, it's appropriate, and it's right. Freedom. So what's our position on what's going on in, in Syria? Assad needs to go. And when I say he needs to go, he needs to go because he's murdering his own people. Now, here's the difference between the virtual president and the actual president. The, virtual, the actual president says, Assad needs to go. And he, he says this like, like you know, he says, basically he, he sends him a strongly worded letter. And he says it in such a way that uh, <laughs> Kelly Beard says about the kilt question, screenshot or it didn't happen. You'll get your screenshots later, don't you worry. And they're, gonna be, they're not going to be cheap either. I've got a members-only site that's going to open up, and it's nine ninety five a month. Um, now, look, here's the situation on Syria. When Barack Obama talks about Syria, he talks about Syria as if he was a community organizer in Chicago. He's the president of the United States, the most powerful man in the world. If Assad wants to go, if he wants Assad to go, he can have... Assad go, and he should have Assad go. I don't buy the Powell Doctrine for a second. This idea that you break it, you buy it, you get involved with the country, you decide you're going to go in there or do something or other, then you suddenly have to rebuild this country from scratch like we did in Iraq, I think that's utter, absolute insanity and nonsense. Virtual president of the United States would have, would have uh, Bashar, Bashar Assad out of office within 48 hours because we would continue to launch cruise missiles at where we knew he was until he was dead. And that would be the end of that kind of oppression there. Then the question becomes, what would you do in his place? And having spoken and gotten to know of uh, just one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, uh, uh, Cynthia Farahat, who's uh, on Facebook, and uh, she's just one of the best people in the world. And Cynthia is, uh, fought this fight from age 22. She was an Egyptian dissident. She was on Mubarak's death list. She was on the... Muslim Brotherhood's death wish from age 22. She ran an opposition party for 10 years in opposition to a government that routinely murdered people. And I, when she talks about dissidents and when she talks about resistance to totalitarian regimes, I listen to her and I believe her because she's been there. And every time I talk to Sin about things like the democracy movement in Egypt or in any other part of the world. Forget about it. Forget about what country, whatever it is. Every time I talk to her about it, I am so astonished and so ashamed at how easy it would be for us to plant these seeds of freedom everywhere. And I mean, without the cost of an American life. You could, without the cost of an American life, you could, through predator strikes, but really those are a little more uh, finesse than we need in the early stages, through cruise missile strikes, through, uh, through uh, highly targeted JDAM strikes from, from uh, B-2 bombers or whatever. I, listen, I would do the same thing with Syria that I would do with any other threat to freedom and, and, and mass murder. I would, tell, I would tell Assad he's got 48 hours to vacate the country if he leaves now. I'm not going to follow him, but he's got 48 hours to go. And if he didn't go, then I would start to launch immediate cruise missile strikes. First thing I would do is I would completely erode whatever air defense capabilities he has left. That alone ought to get the Syrian generals to, to shoot this miserable swine. But I'd take down the air defenses, and then once I had the air defenses down, I'd start cruise missile strikes at, only at command and control headquarters. Right? i try to get him as, as much as I can. And once we had the air defenses down, we wouldn't be you know messing around with these little pinpricks that come from from Tomahawk missiles. I'd put some B-2s over Syria. I'd find out where he is, and I'd put I'd put 2,000-pound JDAMs on every place I thought he was until he was dead. And then we'd see if they could have some free and fair elections, and we'd monitor those. And if it turns out they put a guy in place who was worse, then we'd do this again. What's my motivation for this? How dare I? How, how, you can just hear the liberal heads exploding all across the country, right? How dare you? Listen, freedom is better than slavery. Living is better than being murdered. That's how dare I. We have the most powerful forces in the history of the world because of our freedom. People deserve to live free, and they do not deserve to be murdered by their own government. So you have a choice now, Mr. Assad. You can leave 
and take whatever money you've managed to steal, or the United States of America is going to rain fire from the sky until you stop killing 80,000 innocent people. And then I would look, I would look, I would have the CIA do what the CIA does. I would look at who represents freedom and democracy. You, you know, everybody said, I was skeptical about the democracy movement in Egypt. And I was skeptical when Cynthia said that, that I wasn't using it for lying on the contrary, but in Tahrir Square, when the thing really started to go down, she said they're ringing the church bells of Christian churches. Muslims and Copts are, are hugging each other in the streets and everybody's talking about freedom and everybody's talking about democracy and everybody's talking about rights. And I thought, man, I hope you're right. And then the Muslim Brotherhood moved into Egypt and started to take over. And I thought, man, I could see this coming. I knew this was going to happen. And then the Egyptian people went out there and protested the Muslim Brotherhood. They demonstrated against the Muslim Brotherhood. They took to the streets against the Muslim Brotherhood. Everybody wants to be free. Everybody does. And and when I think about the power we have to surgically remove these murderers and to influence through things like uh, Voice of America and just through things like a little bit of aid, but mostly just through the moral example of being on the side of right. You know, the greatest, the single greatest thing that you can lay at Barack Obama's doorstep, and there's a lot you can lay at his doorstep in terms of missed opportunities and just criminal activities. But there were people dying in the streets of Iran ready to overthrow that government, the worst government in the world, and we couldn't even come out and say we're behind you? Of course not, because we know what side he's on. I would basically say, man, if you have a freedom movement in the streets of people are fighting for their freedom against these tyrants, I would say the United States of America is the de- arsenal of democracy and we're the champions of freedom. And we are no longer going to sit here and tolerate these regimes that do nothing but breed threats to our national security. Iranians getting a nuclear weapon is a threat to our national security. I am not talking about sending American troops to be the policemen of the world and to go over there and get killed for people that don't give a damn. I am not talking about that at all. But I am talking about applying the kind of pressure that only these murdering predator bastards understand, and that is force. And if you're prepared to use force against these people, you generally don't have to use force against these people. I, uh, somebody just said didn't work in Vietnam. Tim Morris, uh, USA, said didn't work in Vietnam. Let me tell you what I do know about Tim about Vietnam, Tim. When you are fighting a war for 11 years and you tell your naval pilots that as they ingress into a target using the same route that they've flown every single time for the last four years at the exact same time of day, and when you tell Navy pilots coming ashore from aircraft carriers that as they fly over Da Nang Harbor and look down at the SAM missiles being unloaded from Russian freighters that are going to shoot them down next week, and you tell them that they're not allowed to go and hit those targets, and you tell them that they have to fly the same routes the same time every day, when you tell people who are flying jets who don't have guns on them, who only have air-to-air missiles, that the rules of engagement say that no matter that we've seen these planes take off from radar, fly from North Vietnam to intercept our guys, when you say the rules of engagement are we have to have a visual identification on that target and see the red stars on its wings before we can take a shot, then I don't particularly know if I want to see that the, the Vietnam War was exactly an example of how to fight smart. Vietnam War was everything exactly the opposite of what I'm talking about, putting great, brave men on the ground without any kind of a sense of a mission, any kind of a sense of objective, tying both hands behind their backs and then telling them to sit out there in the jungles for 11 years and get killed. Nonsense. Nonsense. That war was the clearest example I have ever seen of a victory that was thrown away because every single time Lyndon Johnson would hit a a, a North Vietnamese target to the degree where it hurt them, they started talking, and then the instant he would do that, he'd start, he'd he'd, he'd say a ceasefire. He'd try to show them how swell we were, how swell, what swell guys we were. You know, this war was over when when Nixon started bombing Hanoi. Once he started bombing Hanoi, they they refused to talk peace for 11 years, and Nixon put bombers over Hanoi with B-52s and They were at the table like that, like that. Crichton Abrams had a plan to take existing forces in theater, no extra troops, no extra nothing. This was in the last six months of the war before we got out of there. And he said, I have enough troops on the ground now so that instead of constantly wandering around in the jungles and patrols and getting into this war of attrition and body counts and all of this nonsense, all of this, we're going to trade American boys for Vietnamese kids. Are you out of your mind? 
Are you out of your mind? That's just absolutely insane. Abrams basically said in the last couple of months of that war, he said, I've got enough forces in theater now that I could take an armored column. We would go right up the Ho Tri Minh Trail. We'd just go up the trail. We'd go up the trail with an armored column. We'd put our air power where we needed it, which is in close air support of this thing, and we would drive this column to the center of Hanoi, and from the center of Hanoi, then we'd start having a little discussion about peace. I absolutely believe that would have worked. Absolutely. Absolutely believe that would have worked. We never, ever, ever fought that war. And the same for Korea, by the way. You know, same thing for Korea. We didn't start either of those wars. In the Korean War, these, 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 these communist murdering savages come pouring over the border, right? They drive our entire UN forces down into the Pusan pocket down there, right? And instead of trying to reinforce this pocket, along comes MacArthur with the most brilliant tactical stroke in history. He lands at Incheon. He cuts all of their supply lines, puts his army between the North, the North Koreans and Pyongyang. They make an incredible retreat. They retreat above the 38th parallel. We push them to the absolute corner, and all of a sudden, China gets in the war. Now, listen carefully, because this is going to really cause some heads to explode, right? This is 1952, 1953, maybe even a little earlier. China gets in this war, and, and, and MacArthur says, we need to A-bomb these, these mass wave attacks against our people. And Truman says, no. Now, I'm just going to speculate on something here, right? There were no A-bombs in China in 1950. The Russians had a couple by 1948, I think. If we had basically said to the Chinese, your attack on our people after their un, un, un um, provoked attack against us is an act of war against the United States of America. And if you do not stop your firing on our forces within 24 hours, we will respond to you with nuclear weapons. If they kept attacking us and we had put, he, I think, I think MacArthur wanted to use 12 A-bombs. If he had put 12 A-bombs, not on Chinese cities, we're not talking about bombing Beijing or Shanghai. If he had put 12 atomic bombs on those mass Chinese forces in Korea, then there would not have been a Vietnam. And there wouldn't have been any of this nonsense. None of it. None of it would have happened. None. None. I don't understand it. I think it was the greatest mistake in history. I really do. I absolutely do. I think what it showed the world in 1950 or 51, I forget when it was when MacArthur, I think it must have been 51. When we said that we are, we are willing to let American soldiers be killed by mass Chinese waves and be driven back from winning this war, being driven back to the 38th parallel, when we said we're not willing to use A-bombs to defend our people, that we'd rather have our soldiers be killed on the ground and driven back and frozen to death, that was a signal to the communists and to everybody else who was watching that we don't believe in ourselves and we don't believe in what we say we believe in and, and, and all you have to do to America is just, just push us around as much as you want to. It was the, I, think it was the, I think it was the catastrophic mistake of, um, of, of the 20th century. I'm sorry. And to those people say, oh, how dare you talk about bombing uh, uh, Chinese uh, soldiers? Well, nobody had a pro problem shooting with 50 caliber machine guns. Nobody had problems dropping conventional bombs on those Chinese troops. A dead Chinese soldier is the same as any other dead Chinese soldier. I'd rather have dead Chinese soldiers than dead American soldiers. I'm a little old-fashioned in that regard. Right? Right? So what happens is you don't have the will to defend this society. You don't have the will to defend the Western values. You don't have the will to defend freedoms. You don't have the will to, defense, to defend America and everything America stands in. We didn't invade North Korea and we didn't invade China. When we don't have the will to defend ourselves, is it any wonder that we have all these problems out here today? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. If MacArthur had called for bombing Beijing, that would have been a war crime in my opinion. They're putting troops against our troops. We're putting troops against their troops. I wasn't talking about doing that. But if they've got mass Chinese units in the field that are killing our guys in human wave attacks and taking victory from the jaws of uh, – taking – snatching defeat from the jaws of victory and pushing us back and having all of our guys freeze to death and die out there, no one ever talks about Korea, those poor, poor people that – those soldiers were amazing. They were freezing out there in the middle of nowhere, and we had the means to stop these people, and we didn't. <sighs> so my foreign policy is freedom. You know what? That's freedom. You shouldn't do that to your people. I'm not going to say that we need to go and interfere in every single country's business. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that when Assad is murdering 80,000 of his own people, 
and we can put some bombs onto Assad's head and see if that makes a difference, I'd be willing to do it. I would not be willing, under any circumstances, to put a U.S. invasion force in there and have our, have our young men get killed for those people. You've got to fight for your own freedom. We should be helping these people, and we should be doing things like unleashing the CIA and especially unleashing our propaganda outfits. Propaganda, by the way, is not necessarily a dirty word. I think when you talk about the propaganda that Voice of America did was it just told the truth to the, to the communist bloc, and people had hope. It gave them hope. Last thing I'll say on this subject in terms of Obama standing up to the Iranians, which he didn't do, but after the Cold War was over and the Iron Curtain fell and the Soviet Union fell, the one thing you heard from everywhere, but especially in places like Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and all these other places, you heard people say that when Ronald Reagan said, we're on your side, we knew we had a chance. It gave us hope. When Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and Pope John Paul II, those three, when those three people said, no, 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 no. You shouldn't have to live this way. This is a crime that you're living this way. And free people stand with you. That's what gave, that's what gave solidarity the strength to do it. Lech, you never would have heard the name Lech Walesa. He would have been taken out and shot in the back of an alley someplace if Pope John Paul II hadn't gone up there basically and hugged and kissed that man and made him visible. Once he did that, figuratively even, game was over. Game was over. Anyway, that's uh, foreign policy.